I tried my best not to look hungover. Mrs. Novakova was already pissed as hell. I didn't need her thinking that I'm a drunk. The noise has to stop. I've asked all of the other neighbors and they are very unhappy as well. I opened my mouth to speak. To tell her that there's no way that any noise could be coming out of my apartment in the middle of the night. But she cut me off. And please, don't tell me that that noise isn't coming from your apartment. I've asked everyone, every single person who lives nearby, and they all think the noise is coming out of your apartment. Every night, you keep on pushing furniture around as if you're trying to keep us up. I I'm not here during the night. I... And you know what? I got used to it. I hate to admit it, but I gave up. I called the building manager and he's useless. I wasn't going to let your ruckus take charge of my life. No, I got earbuds. I got my kids earbuds. I got my husband earbuds. We just made peace with having an insensitive neighbor. But you know what I can't make peace with. She adjusted her glasses and shot me a look of utter disgust. Animal cruelty. Animal cruelty. The word slipped out of me with the smell of a stale Long Island. I smelt it, and so did she. With added gusto, as in the fact that I had a couple of drinks last night and made me ten times the monster, she yelled, Animal cruelty! Her voice bounced through the halls of the apartment complex. It echoed. Soviets built housing projects were made to bounce the sounds of a neighborhood drama. It's not like there was anything good on television before the revolution. Last night, I heard your poor little dog howling all night long. It sounded like it was in pain. You're abusing your dog and I know it. Why, I have half a mind to call the police on you. She was yelling now. As she spoke, I could hear doors opening all throughout the unit. The neighbors were listening. I do not have a dog. I screamed as loud as I could, hoping to clear my name. Mrs. Novakova stepped back in shock, but soon she was back in the offensive, jabbing a garishly panted nail under my nose. Do not scream at me, you drunk. You will be evicted. I'm calling the building manager right this instant. Good day. She stomped off back to her apartment. I don't have a dog. I yelled again, making my case to the eavesdroppers. I barely live here. I went back into my apartment and back to sleep. That was two weeks ago. I was a pub crawl attendant, literally a drunk for hire. People would come here for beer. Prague, after all, was the world capital of the stuff, and I would provide the stuff. Tourists would pay an entry fee to get into the crawl. They would get some watered down cheap beer and then we would travel from tourist trap to tourist trap, a hundred drunk strong until I clocked out. After work, I would join them for a couple of drinks. It wasn't exactly the most glorious of gigs, but it paid the bills. An apartment is really just a place to keep your stuff if you drink for a living. I would spend most of my nights out on the town, only to come back to the outskirts to sleep from morning until late afternoon and then I would go back to work. It was a nice little way to burn through my late 20s. A crowd of blurred faces, free drinks and the occasional exotic hookup. Mrs. Novakova's complaints didn't bother me much, but then again, nothing bothers you much when you live on a diet of alcohol. The neighbors might not have liked me. Hangovers started off all my mornings and I was certain I was chopping a good five years off my life expectancy. Yet aside from that, life was good. That was two weeks ago. One week ago, the crowds of tourists started to thin. People would ask about whether what we were doing was safe and even legal. Of course it's legal, I thought. Who would have an issue with some harmless binge drinking? But then the bands came. At first, we had to limit the pub crawl at 100 people and then 80, and then 50, and then 20, and then 5. And then they closed all the bars. A news story about China turned into a news story about Italy, 
which turned into a news story about Oz. And it looked like it very well could be the last news story that there would ever be about us. But if proper precautions were taken, if human contact was cut down to a complete minimum, the virus would stop spreading. The world from two weeks ago seemed so distant. As it became obvious that the virus was here to stay, I couldn't help but think about the crowds that I led through the city before the outbreak. The drunken tourist who would make out with someone from the other side of the world. Someone who didn't even seem the least bit sick. But in two weeks, they would reveal a new souvenir they brought home. An epidemic. I would lay in bed terrified of the death tolls. Of the overcrowded hospitals. Of the possible economic collapse. And yet there were smarter people than me working on solving those problems. As long as most people would do the right thing and engage in social distancing, we would be fine. I should have been worried about something else. I should have been worried about the creature living in my walls. The first night of the quarantine was the hardest. And Before the lockdown, I could still head out and drink. I could still crash on someone's couch or stay out in town until dawn. But now the country was on a lockdown. Traveling was forbidden, unless it was for food shopping, work, or emergencies. The talking head on TV, our Slovakian billionaire turned Czech prime minister, didn't inspire too much confidence in the people that had marched in protest against him a month prior. But the experts seemed convincing enough. If it meant that we would still have a stable society in a year, we figured that hibernating at home for a month or two was worth it. I knew that things were most likely going to turn out fine. That the government taking an active role in stopping the spread infinitely increased our chance at survival. But as I laid in that bed, my mind started to think about other possibilities. If I got sick, I would probably be fine. But if the hospital system collapsed, I wouldn't be. Suddenly, the room started feeling too small. It was too quiet. Above me, below me, to the left and right, everywhere there were people just like me, waiting to see whether the world was going to end or not. I started forgetting to breathe. I was panicking. Above me, people were probably panicking too. Someone would snap. Things would turn ugly. I got whipped out of my paranoia by a sound. A sound from my living room. It was as if the lock was being fiddled with. All thoughts of impending doom were gone and replaced with a more primal thought. Someone was in my house. I held my breath. A loud dragging noise came out of the other room. I immediately sat up. I could hear my pulse. Aside from my bong, there was nothing weapon worthy around me. The dragging noise stopped. I grabbed my bong and I was prepared to spill dirty water all over the place in self-defense. Nothing moved. Complete silence. Hello? I finally said, standing up. For a split second, I thought I heard the dragon again, and a sound of a closing door. But the realization that I was standing in the middle of the room at 2 in the morning armed with a plastic bong screamed over any fear. I was losing it. It was the first day of the quarantine and I was losing it. I needed a cigarette. When people think of Prague, they think of the castle, of the spires, of the old churches, but most of us live in Soviet-era housing blocks. What once used to be villages and farmland was transformed into housing projects that just scream communism. Aesthetics didn't matter. The powers of that bee just needed a place to cram in the products of the baby boom. Circular blocks made of gray cement for the worker ants, with a hospital or school in the center to keep them docile. Dozens upon dozens of these architectural monstrosities litter the outskirts of Prague. I wasn't the only one on their balcony that night. As I lit up, I could see dozens of others standing by the railings, all puffing on cigarettes all trying to make sense of this new world that we were thrust into. The stillness of the night was suddenly cut through with a sharp pitch. The circular nature of the housing projects made them an amphitheater. 
The sound bounced enough to be heard by everyone on their balconies. Beneath the street lamps, you could see the source. An old man walking his dog, whistling. The pooch happily trotted by on a leash as the man hobbled along. There was a cheerful force in his whistle. He wasn't just in a good mood. He wanted everyone in the neighborhood to know that he was in a good mood. No one left their balcony. We all just quietly smoked, chucking in one cancer stick after the other, just to have an excuse to listen to the old-timer whistle. There was something calming about seeing someone so cheery. If that guy could make sense of all of this, so could we. When the old man finished off the walk and went into his building, a couple of the balcony people clapped, but they were immediately shushed. It was 2 a.m., not the time for applause. Yet the mood of camaraderie remained. As we finished off our cigarettes and went to sleep, we waved at each other. I got back into bed and I started to drift off. Yet as I was about to start dreaming, I heard something in the wall. Gentle touches, as if something small was trying to scrape at the wall from the other side. The sound was quiet, but it raised an alarm in my head. Rats. My eyes bolted open with worry. I would be stuck in this tiny apartment for two months with a bunch of rats. They would nibble away at my food and make me sick. I was going to die. The room started to close in on me again, but... As if my mind was being dragged back to shore, I could hear the old man's whistle. Okay, so let's say there's rats. What can you do about rats? Rat poison, right? Just drop by the store tomorrow and pick up some rat poison. There, that settles it. What else is on the docket? My breathing soothed. I had a plan. I was good. The panic subsided and the exhaustion flowed back through my body. I rolled over to my side and I passed out. In the knowledge that I could deal with the rats. Little did I know that those were not rats in my walls. In the morning, I fished out an old bandana and I wrapped it around my face. I looked absurd, like a Wild West train robber in a dirty hoodie. Yet rules were rules. I left my apartment block and I headed towards the store. The shelves in the supermarket weren't exactly overflowing, but they were a lot more full than the news made them sound. Shoppers quietly moved around in a variety of improvised face masks. If you met their eyes, you would see the hint of a polite smile under their makeshift respirators, but then they would quickly move away, and no one wanted to stand too close together. I had already stocked up on non-perishables, but I figured a bit more food wouldn't hurt. I grabbed some beer and I roamed around the store until I found rat poison. Fully equipped for my rat problem, I was just about ready to go pay. But there was one more aisle that I wanted to check out. Please, only take one package per family and be responsible. The sign outside of the toilet paper aisle read. I tried to think back to how crowded toiletry aisles usually are, but I couldn't tell the difference. I grabbed a package just for safety but before I knew it, there is another one in my hand. I couldn't really explain it. It's not like I have bowel issues or anything. I just kept on thinking back to all the videos of people physically fighting for toilet paper and wondering, what do they know that I don't? A throat was cleared behind me. The fact that we are in the midst of a pandemic amplified the startle. Mrs. Novakova, in what seemed to be a hand-knitted face mask, stood the ordained two-meter distance behind me. Her eyes were staring the usual daggers at first, but as soon as she noticed that I was holding two packages of toilet paper, something snapped in her. Her eyes jumped between the sign and my hands in disbelief. Finally, they focused on mine. A mad panic blazed behind them, a look of a cornered animal. I am so close to the edge right now. I am terrified of this turning violent. But if you push, then it will. I put one of the packages down. We both breathed a sigh of relief. The crisis was averted. 
She nodded and I nodded, and we went our separate ways. Her look is stuck with me though. You didn't see real panic every day, at least not before the outbreak. As I checked out, I could see a glint of that same expression behind the cashier's eyes. We were all barely holding on. The whole trip to the supermarket was exhausting. After coming home, I prepared to set up the rat trap. But as I looked at the little poisonous balls, my mind wandered. The stuff looked like Tic Tacs. It seemed so absurd that something so plain looking could kill something. It seemed even more bizarre that there was something invisible outside, closing on borders. I put the package down in the kitchen, and I laid back down in bed. Sure, there was rat poison to set up, lunch to cook, a life to live. But after seeing the suppressed panic outside, all I could do was stare up at the ceiling. Quiet thoughts of the end of the world filled my mind. After what felt like an hour, I snapped out of it. It was time for a beer. I wasn't alone on my balcony. Well, theoretically I was. But all across the projects you could see other people nursing a lonely beer on their own balconies. You could take the checks out of the pubs. But you couldn't take the pubs out of the checks. We all sat with our booze and puffed away on our cigarettes. The spirits of Prague after an election year still roamed the neighborhood. Something bad had happened and the universe seemed uncertain, but at least we had booze and smokes. We all snapped to attention. Some even got up to the edges of their balconies to see better. The whistling was back, bouncing cheerily through the sad Soviet walls. The old man hobbled defiantly with his dog, whistling as loud as he could. As his music boomed across the housing projects, people started to open their windows. Soon, every balcony was occupied. He continued whistling for a while, as if pretending that he didn't know that there was a couple hundred people listening. But eventually, he let go of all pretenses and looked around at his audience. My grandkids, they keep asking me how life was under the communist regime. He echoed throughout the neighborhood. They told them that things were the same as they are now. No one is allowed in and out of our country. The streets are empty. The shops are running out of food and there's some Slovakian asshole talking to us in broken Czech every evening, telling us that everything is fine. A bit of laughter and a faint row of applause whimpered its way through the neighborhood. An old grizzly bear of a man on the other side of the housing project stirred. He had been comfortably sitting in a lawn chair, nursed in a beer and boxers and a stained wife beater. But after the applause died down, he lumped over to the edge of his balcony. I work at a post office, he roared. Last week, three men came in with masks. We all panicked. He took a defiant swig of his beer. Turns out, it was just a robbery. This time, the laughter and applause came with purpose. Something was happening. I've been married for 20 years. My husband won't pay any attention to me. A familiar voice shot it from the apartment below mine. It was Mrs. Novakova. So I started coughing. The crowd went wild. And that last bit of boomer humor started off a barrage of jokes all across the neighborhood. Everyone gathered by their windows, trying to produce the next little gem that would distract us from the quarantine. I kept on trying to come up with a joke of my own, something I could yell to become a part of the community. But as I listened to everyone laugh, I heard something else. The dragging noise from my living room was back. The joke telling contest had put me in such good spirits that the thought of fear didn't even occur to me as I walked over to my living room. When I saw my couch pulled away from my wall, I was more confused than scared. The thought of something else in the house wasn't in the realm of possibility. I walked around the couch, trying to figure out how it had moved. It was one of those joyless, Soviet-era relics. The couch had been in the apartment, and the planet for longer than I had. The paint on the walls behind the couch seemed just as ancient. 
A small rectangular door was pressed into it. As I studied the strange door, the laughter from the street lost all of its joy. My mind wrestled with the thought of the door's purpose, and settled on the idea that it was probably a panic closet from the communist era. That was probably where the rats were hiding. For a split second, I was calm, but then something behind the door rustled. Something bigger than a rat. I ran back to my room and I grabbed my bong. I needed a weapon. When I returned back, the door was cracked open. Something on the other side was desperately trying to keep it shut but failing. My hand started to sweat. The plastic felt impossibly fragile against my palms. Hey, what is this? I squeaked. The force on the other side let go. Within a couple of seconds, I could see what was behind the door. A dark passageway that extended to beyond my sight. I have a gun! I instinctively yelled. I didn't have a gun. It came out of nowhere like a pandemic. I stood there in silence, gripping my bong, waiting for some sort of a hint of life beyond the wall. When it came, it wasn't a hint. It was an official announcement. Ah! It shrieked in a raspy voice. Sickly yellow eyes with reptilian pupils, a mouthful of needle-sharp teeth like obsidian claws. The thing jumped out of its hiding like a rabid grasshopper. It went straight for me. I spilled dirty bong water all over the place when I swiped at the creature. The thing moved towards me with manic speed, but one hit from my bong changed the creature's trajectory. Ugh! The thing smashed up against the side of the couch. I ran into the kitchen and I searched for a knife. I wanted to scream, to let my neighbors know that I was in danger. But only a weak whimper came out of my throat. There was no time for yelling. This was fight or flight and I had nowhere to run to. I could hear the creature scampering to its feet in the other room. I found a butcher knife and I backed up onto the corner. The creature ran into the kitchen. Its claws poised to slit my throat. But as soon as it saw my knife, it slowed. The thing looked menacing at first. Its claws and teeth made sure of that. But the rest of its body was fragile. It looked like a malnourished child, its lungs heaving in panic. As it moved forward, its panicked gaze jumped between the knife and my eyes. An image of Mrs. Novakova in the supermarket flashed in my memory. The creature stopped its approach, the designated two meters away from me. Please don't kill me, it whispered. There was fear in its eyes, but its claws were sharp. I kept the knife leveled. Please, please don't hurt me. I I'm just trying to survive, it pleaded. Its claws clinked as they shook in fear. What are you? I managed to squeeze out my windpipe. Please, don't hurt me. I'm weak. Please, it begged, lowering its claws. Without thinking, I lowered my knife. The creature's eyes sparked with happiness. He closed his jaw, hiding those pointed teeth. What are you? I repeated, this time with a bit more confidence. I'm Wenceslas. I live in your wall, the creature said. His eyes ripped away from me and searched the room. There is a hint of shame in his raspy voice. I have always lived in your wall. When you would leave during the night, I would come out. I'm ashamed for my intrusion, but the space beyond the wall is small. I'm sorry if I ever made a mess. His eyes finally met mine. As inhuman as they seemed, I sensed a look of regret. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I had to. There's nowhere else to go for me. I am also sorry for eating your food. I've only taken what was in the trash or what had sat in the fridge for more than three nights, but I apologize for my theft regardless. I was doing it to survive. The only thing which I took which I did not need, and which I want to apologize for profusely, is your tea. Tea? I finally managed to say. 
Memories of finding oddly placed tea mugs around my house filled my mind. Yes, tea. Tea is my vice and I apologize for it. I couldn't resist. His head drifted from me to the tea kettle. When he noticed me noticing, one Celeste lowered his head in shame. Do you... I couldn't believe what I was about to say. Do you want some tea? Once Liz flashed an excited grin. His teeth were coated in yellowish grime. Yes, please. I turned on the kettle and I made my way to pick up two mugs out of the counter. As I moved towards Once Liz, he cautiously backed up. His face kept up a polite, diseased smile but his claws twitched in fear. I got the cups and I leaned against my kitchen counter. I was filled with both questions and fear, but I settled on the former. Once Lewis seemed more scared than dangerous. What are you? Once Lewis stared at the tea kettle for a while, as if trying to come up with an answer. I don't know, he finally said. My people, they have lived here for hundreds of years. We lived in the forest and then among the fields, and then among the basements of the village folk. When the men and the machines came and started building, we simply hid within the walls, hoping that things would go back to normal. Once Lewis sighed. But they never did. I haven't seen any of my brothers or sisters for decades. The world outside is too dangerous. I pray they are still alive, but I do not know. I live in fear. I have nowhere to go. He blinked, his strange eyes growing larger. Please, don't make me leave. Please don't hurt me. The water had started its low rumble. People outside were still laughing. The spirits of camaraderie floated around the housing projects. I won't hurt you. I promise. I promise as well. I promise I'll be helpful. These passages, all oh my friend, they lead to other apartments. I can bring you things. Do you know the woman who lives below you? There is a fire in his eyes. The same type of excitement that I imagined shipwrecked people feel when they see a cruise liner. Mrs. Novakova, yeah, I know her. Yes, I seldom go to her house. Her youngest one saw me and almost revealed me to the world. But last night, when I thought you heard me, I went to her home. I stole some bread, a couple packages of mint tea, and two rolls of toilet paper. You can have it. It can be my penance for living in your home uninvited. I can bring you more. Yes, I can most definitely bring you more. Images of Mrs. Novakova in the toilet paper aisle filled my head again. She looked so scared. Don't steal from her. You can stay here, but don't steal from her. It took me a second to register, what just came out of my mouth. I was letting a wall-dwelling monstrosity stay in my home. I was giving it moral lectures and making it tea. The situation weighed on my chest for a split second, but I preferred it to violence. The kettle clicked. I'm so sorry. Please, don't punish me. Wenzel has whimpered his claws half rising into the air. Don't worry, we'll make it through this without stealing. I poured the tea and I handed Wenceslas a mug. Saying those words soothed me. Outside, the laughter had died down. People started to sing. Let's go sit. I started to make my way to the living room, but suddenly, the Wenceslas' claws were blocking the doorway. Please, he was shaking again, that mad look jumping around in his eyes. Please don't speak of this to anyone. If others find out, they may be less charitable. They may seek to kill my brothers and sisters. The claws contracted, scarring the wall. My kin may turn violent. Please, if they live, they must remain a secret. I nodded. I tried imagining Mrs. Novakova finding a needle-teeth visitor in her home, and I figured Wenceslas was right. 
No one else needed an owl. I was going to sit down with him, pick at that field of questions that his existence sowed, but the mess on the floor bothered me. I mopped up the dirty water and excused myself to put away the bong. The whole time, Wenzel sat on the floor, silent, tapping away at his mug with a polite smile. The crowd outside had started to sing the national anthem. By the time I put the bong back into my bedroom, every window in the neighborhood had someone leaning out of it. The housing project shook with the echo of the first couple of lines in the anthem. Where is my home? Where is my home? The quarantine chorus sang. The following lines grew more mumbly. Not everyone knew the full extent of the anthem, but everyone wanted to be a part of the singing. The words rattled on in a friendly spirit but picked up with the last line. Everyone knew this one. I found myself singing along. Among checks is my home. Among the checks is my home. The cement around us vibrated. The panic was stifled, if only for a moment. Applause, cheers. The housing project shook with camaraderie. We would all get through this. No one was alone. Your tea will get cold. Please, don't let a good tea go to waste. Once Lewis came in, balancing my cup in his paws. I had almost forgotten about him. I looked at the shivering creature and figured it was just as scared as everyone else in the neighborhood. We could make it through this quarantine together. At least I would have someone to talk to. Hey, I said, thinking back to my conversation with Mrs. Novakova two weeks prior. Did you ever howl? I had a neighbor complain about howling here in the middle of the night. Once Lissa's eyes drifted to the floor, he held the teacup up to his chest. Yes, sometimes I howl, he admitted. I apologize. I didn't mean to anger your neighbor. But living in the wall, living in a small space with no escape, sometimes one just wants to scream. The crowd outside started off another song. The housing projects shook once more. I understand. He extended the mug of tea. Now please, the tea is getting cold. I took the tea from him, raised it to my lips, and was about to take a drink. But my eyes wandered. I froze. He had that look in his eyes. That manic look of panic. A shiver traveled down my spine. I started to grow dizzy with fear. Sorry, I have to go to the bathroom, I mumbled. Well, don't forget about the tea. You really shouldn't be drinking cold tea. It's an insult to the leaves, he said with a forced smile. Those eyes couldn't trick me. I rushed to the bathroom and I locked the door. I can't scream for help. There is way too much singing and laughing going outside for me to even be heard. I have no way to defend myself. In my panic, I didn't think of my next step. I just knew that I needed to get away from Wenzelis. I knew I had to get away from that monster. All I have was my phone. I thought about contacting the authorities, but I can hear him on the other side of the door. He's listening, waiting to see what I do. You know what's really good for stomach problems? Some warm tea, he keeps on saying. I don't know if he knows I know. I don't know if he knows I saw those little deadly balls on the bottom of the tea he wanted me to drink. I don't know if he knows that I know he's trying to poison me. He's growing more agitated by the second. His talk of tea is growing violent. I can hear him tapping his sharp claws on the flimsy bathroom door. All I have to defend me is toilet paper.